Well, amen. We want to invite you to stand and uh, we have begun this service with proclaiming the truth that we're here to celebrate today. Uh, there's no body in the grave now. And uh, we've been waiting for Sunday, if you were here on Friday. Uh, we've been waiting for this day with anticipation. And uh, so now we're here to celebrate. Let's sing together. <clears throat> A great light dawns in Galilee. Some say madman, some say king. Wonder working rebel priest Jesus Christ the Nazarene He knew well what it would take To free us all from sin and grave A perfect man would have to die only he could pay that price Friday's good cause Sunday's coming Don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming Devil you're done you better start running well, Friday's good cause Sunday's coming So we let those soldiers take him in As his friend betrayed him with a kiss There before the mocking crowd Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound Then he carried that cross to Calvary And he shared Bye. 
a shout at the Lord this morning. He is coming soon. seated. We're glad that you're here to worship and to celebrate our risen Savior with us this morning. And by the looks of things, there's some folks here who I've never met before. And we're glad that you're here. Um, and we hope that you've already uh, felt welcomed uh, in this house today. And uh, we want to get to know you just a little better if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit of yourself with us today. Uh, back on the table, uh, there are some connection cards. That's one way that you can use to communicate to us. Uh, just give us a name, a good email address. However much information you're comfortable sharing uh, would be wonderful uh, to get that from you today. 
And uh, for anyone, uh, if you're a first-time guest, if you've been here for uh, as long as the church has been open almost, uh, we'd love to uh, get prayer requests from you, any other information you need to share with us. You can use one of those cards as well. And if you just don't quite have enough time after service today, that's okay. Please go online and do that. Uh, you can share that information with us there. We would love to put you on our mailing list just to give you updates on what's going on weekly in the life of our church. And uh, uh, we, we would appreciate that, but we uh, hope and like to think that you would appreciate that as well, uh, as uh, many of you may be looking for a church home. And so we're glad that you're here to share your Easter Sunday with us. And uh, as we continue worshiping today, um, this next song, it, it sort of a little bit of reflective back um, on what God did for us. His, his title is what he's done. And it's easy to come in and celebrate the resurrection. And that's kind of what we tend to do on Easter Sunday. Um, but it's always good for us to just pause and say, thank you, God, for doing that. Thank you for what it took to get to this point. Um, and we looked at that on Good Friday. We looked at it last Sunday during Palm Sunday. Uh, but this song really is another declaration of what Christ did on our behalf. And if you um, are in here today and maybe, you know, you're just doing the Easter thing, you came because mom said you should come or, you know, you felt obligated somehow or this is your, you know, once or twice a year kind of thing. Um, we'd love for that to become more for you than just checking off a box or doing something out of obligation. To understand really, truly, and fully what Christ did for us and to receive that gift and then to say, I want to go. I want to be there. I want to be part of that celebration. And let me clarify for you also, today's not the only day we celebrate the resurrection. We're pretty much here 52 Sundays of a year. And pretty much 52 Sundays of a year, that's what we're here for, to celebrate the risen Savior and to point people to God and point people to Christ. And so we hope this song will help do that for you. Uh, if you uh, are a, a person who's been a believer and walked with the Lord for a long time, it'll just be another good reminder for you. And if you haven't been walking with him, that's okay. It, maybe this will be a, a, a reminder and an encouragement for you as well. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And uh, we're going to sing this song together. <clears throat>
future is heaven. And I praise God for what He's done. Lord, we praise you. We give you thanks for what you've done. You died on Calvary's cross, but you didn't stay in that grave. And you have come out to live forevermore. And because of that, God, you have given us the ability to have everlasting life. Forgiveness of sin, the power to overcome. And Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you. We celebrate that this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done by conquering death, hell, and the grave. Lord, speak to us now as we look in your word. Teach us more about who you are and about who you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning. morning. Joy to heaven in the Lord's house today. We're so thankful to be here. And um, he's risen. He has, in fact. And we are very grateful for that fact and very thankful for that, how that informs us and um, gives us hope and encouragement and uh, strength to carry on. Um, while you're finding John chapter 20, uh, let me say it would only be appropriate for me to say uh, our special thanks for all the folks who've been involved in all the stuff that went into this week. This did not happen by one person's effort by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the facilities look fabulous. Amen. Uh, the, the, the food was fabulous. And if you were here for the, uh, the morning uh, uh, festivities, and uh, uh, I'm kind of partial to that guy who was preaching. Just to be honest, I really, I really like him a lot. And uh, we're honored and blessed to have Seth and uh, uh, Laura and the kids with us today. That is, a, uh, that is always a blessing. And we're very thankful for what the Lord is doing in their lives. And thankful for each of you who are here to be a part of the service today. Thank you for that very much. Um, one of the things that I like about the scripture, and there are numerous things. Um, the scripture is in a lot of ways, full of stories. Notice that you have? Uh, like 77% of scripture is, is stories. I love that. I just love that. I really do. Um, I, I don't know that I could have, uh, um, well, it's not lecture, you know? It's not lecture. And so when I, when, I, when I stand to preach, I always think about that, and I always think in terms of story. I really do, because that's just kind of uh, the way the Lord has kind of uh, uh, made me. And so today I wanted us to, to look at a particular story about a particular person. Uh, one of the great things that you have in the scriptures, you have stories about individuals and uh, their interaction with the Lord and their interaction with the, uh, the church. And I, I'm here to tell you that um, we're going to look at one today that I think is very significant and one that's very well worth our time and effort. Um, partly because She's got a bad rap in the culture in which you and I live. Uh, she has been um, she has been maligned. Uh, she has been lied about uh, for the sake of profit. I will add. Uh, she has been uh, she has been misused, misrepresented, uh, and mistreated. And I feel like today might be a good time on this Easter morning, since she was part of the original Easter service, uh, that it might be a good time for us to take a look at that. So we're going to take a look at uh, John chapter twenty, and we're going to begin reading in verse one of that twentieth chapter. And we're going to ask you, if you will, stand with us, reverence the Lord's word as we read there together this morning, from John chapter twenty, beginning at verse one. The scripture says this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. 
So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. By the way, John's speaking about himself there. Ain't that cool? Uh, didn't, wouldn't even use his own name, but he, 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 whenever you, you find him described in this gospel, that's how he says it, the disciple that Jesus loved. And said to them, uh, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And so Peter and the other disciples went forth, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. I like that. He saw and believed. For as yet they had not understood the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. And all the church to that can say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Mary is a very fascinating person. She really honestly is. She, uh, uh, she is called in this particular passage Magdalene. Uh, by the way, that is not her last name, okay? Just so we're clear, that is not her last name. Uh, she is uh, called Magdalene because, uh, well, there are a number of Marys in the story. If you've read the gospel, you know that there are more than one. And so in order to determine who is who is who, uh, sometimes they will assign them a separate uh, title, which they did in this particular case, uh, because Mary was from a place called Magdala. Now, Magdala is on the southwestern corner of the, of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's a very small little, it was a very small fishing village in Jesus' day. And um, Mary has uh, is, uh, shared, her story is shared kind of in various places in the Gospels. Um, from what we can gather, and uh, uh, there's a little more conjecture here maybe than I would like, but what we can gather, she was one of the ladies uh, that is listed as supporting Jesus financially. Now, um, which would kind of indicate that she was a woman of some substance and uh, had some wealth, and she decided she was going to plow that wealth into Jesus' ministry. Is that a good idea? Okay, good, good, good. I'm glad that you like that, that, that that's a good idea. It is good. Is it still a good idea? Amen. It's still a good idea. Say, Brother Steve, you're preaching on money. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you, I'm just offering up what the scripture says here, okay? And, and so what, what we, the, the thing is, there are things about Mary that I wish I knew that I don't know, okay? I don't have her backstory. There is nothing in the scripture that indicates, uh, with the exception that she came from the small fishing village and that she had some means about her. I, I got nothing. I got nothing except for one thing that we're also given uh, in Mark's gospel and also here. Um, the Lord did something for her, something rather spectacular. The scripture talks about the fact that he cast out seven demons from her. Now, somebody's going to say, Brother Steve, everybody knows there is no such thing as demons. This is... Uh, Ancient superstition that you're reading here. This is nothing to have anything to do with the modern world or anything like it. But I suggest to you that if that is your feeling, if that's your thinking, 
You couldn't possibly be more wrong. Let me tell you the truth. Jesus believed in demons. Not only that, the demons believed in him. <laughs> okay? And so, uh, just so we're clear, demons still exist. My friends, it, demons still, and you know, even in our day, they still exist. Now, I know that we have become very sophisticated, and we think we have a handle on everything, and we are uh, believers in modern science, or at least what modern science could bring to us. Uh, and we sort of, you know, we kind of we shuffle that into the, uh, to the background, and say, you know, demons no longer exist. May I suggest to you that they do? In fact, you can look at some of the things that have gone on uh, just, in, uh, just in our lifetime. I'm not sure you can find a way to explain that away outside of demons working in people. And this particular person had not one, but she had seven until she met Jesus. Now, I would love to have heard the backstory of that. I would have just loved to have heard the backstory of that. And I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I know there are people who've tried to write backstories for it. Um, some of y'all have... Uh, um, uh, heard or read or seen that uh, composition called the Da Vinci Code. Um, may I say something to you about that? Um, Mr. Brown is an unbeliever who hates the Catholic Church. These, these, are, these are facts. These are, not, these are not things I'm making up and just tossing out to you. These are, these are facts. And one of the ways that he decided he was going to get back at the Catholic Church or whatever grievances that he had against them, he wrote the Da Vinci Code. And uh, so if, if, if just, so, just so we're clear, nothing about what that supposes about Mary Magdalene is true. Nothing. Absolutely, positively nothing. And, and quite frankly, I think he missed the boat because uh, if he told the real story... To me, that's a lot more interesting about what happened, okay, this sort of thing that, that we have about her. But instead, we, have, uh, we, we contend with things in, in modern parlance, you know, that uh, uh, folks kind of, uh, well, some people are, some people are gullible. I hope you're not one of them, but some people are. They're gullible. They just buy into stuff. You know, well, you know, they, uh, they, uh, they're folks who believe that things, you know, if it gets written in a book, it must be true. It's on the internet, it must be true. It's on social media, it must be true. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, man, what, watch out, will you please? I mean, this is, this is dangerous stuff. But at, at any rate, what we have here is we have, um, we have, have an account of uh, Jesus uh, uh, has risen from the dead. And it's very interesting, according to at least two of the Gospels, and three if you, depending on how you read them, uh, Mary Magdalene was the very first person to find the tomb empty. She is also the very first person to see Jesus alive. Now, that's fascinating. Now, can I tell you why it's fascinating? And this is one of the reasons why I know that there are folks who kind of discredit, well, the scriptures were written, you know, by, by, by folks who had their own agenda and they were, you know, they, 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 they weren't telling the truth. Can I say to you, uh, everything about this particular account screams the truth. And one of the reasons why it does is because the first appearance of Jesus and the first appearance of the empty tomb came to a woman. Okay. Uh, in a day when women weren't allowed to testify in court, when their word was discounted and had to be backed up by a man if it was going to be accepted at all. That, that's, that's, the, that's the culture out of which this comes. And so it's interesting to me that if that's the case, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to make something up and I'm going to, you know, kind of start this tale that's going to carry on, uh, I, I would have at least started with a couple guys, right? Now, uh, Scripture talks about the fact two guys show up after her, you know, Peter and John, after they get the word from her that that's the case. Uh, but, uh, and I would have just started there. But uh, the Scripture doesn't talk about that. In, fa in fact, it talks about very plainly that she was the first one there. She came with... Uh, other ladies at some point, uh, and uh, were planning to actually uh, embalm Jesus' body, you know, anoint it, but um, didn't get the chance, found the tomb was empty. 
And then after Peter and John had gone back to their home amazed, the scripture says, she turns around, she sees a guy standing there out in front of the tomb. John lets us in on the secret. It's Jesus. But she doesn't notice that. In fact, uh, she doesn't recognize him. You say, why doesn't she recognize him? Well, not really sure about that. I'm really not sure about that. Perhaps just simply the fact that maybe there's tears in her eyes, you know, because she's been weeping bitterly, the scripture says. Maybe it's because um, Jesus is probably the last person she expects to see there. Now, unlike us, we Easter people who expect Jesus to be gone from the tomb, she did not. Okay, she did not at all. And so it was a shocking sort of thing for her. And uh, she, she just, she just kind of turns around and she, she makes a presumption. Uh, she assumes he's a gardener. Your brother Steve, why would she presume that? Because they're in a garden. Okay, uh, they're in a garden and uh, she sees this guy and she's, you know, you know, and uh, she starts talking to him and, and he's asking her this question, you know, why are you weeping? And they say, she says, well, you know, uh, they, they've taken away the body. Wait a minute. Can it, can it, you may want to mark this in your Bible. They have taken away the body of my Lord. Now, it's interesting that she would use that term because if Jesus is dead, uh, he wouldn't be her Lord anymore. But she says, they've taken away the body of my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. And if you will tell me where you've taken him, I'll go there and I'll claim him and I'll, get, I'll take him off your hands. And Jesus says one word to her. Mary. <laughs> and I think there was something in that word. Uh, by the way, uh, you all recognize other people's voices, don't you, if you've been around them long? You know, um, maybe your mom or your dad or your kids or, you know, somebody that you're close to, your spouse, perhaps. I'd know that voice anywhere, right? That was her. She knew that voice anyway. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, <laughs> I know who this is. And it would appear, now I'm not really sure, but I'm just going to make a guess, that she probably ran and hugged him. <laughs> now, I'm just guessing this. And the reason I, I, I suggest that he, she ran and hugged him, uh, or she may have grabbed him by the feet, I don't know, you know, what, whichever one of those pictures you prefer to have in your head. Uh, she did that, and he says, uh, you're going to have to quit hanging on to me. Uh, things had changed, you see. Since the, 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 he, he wasn't coming back to uh, interact with them and live with them the way he had done for three years prior to. Uh, whole new story, right? Whole new story. Uh, actually, a whole new story that you and I are a part of. Praise God. And uh, so that, that's, what he's, that's, what, that's what you have here. Now, um, that's a great story for Easter, right? That's, that, that, that works. Um, can we back up just a little bit on, uh, on Mary Magdalene? Because there's, like, uh, there's, like, there's like five things that I want you to think about. There are five questions I would like to ask you this morning in relationship to that. Uh, they're not long, so don't freak out. Um, okay. Uh, first one is this. What if you had a demon? Ever given any thought to that? What that would be like? What would it be like to be demon possessed? I mean, what, what would that be like? I mean, in, in Jesus' day, but our day as well. What, what would that be like? I mean, that would be like, I mean, wouldn't that be the weirdest thing? To, to not have control over yourself, that there was another thing inside you. That, that had you do things. I mean, I, I, I jumped to pictures of like, uh, well, uh, you, you remember that guy, uh, Legion? Remember him? Uh, he got possessed, right, uh, by, by multiple demons. But, and, and what happened with him is uh, all of a sudden um, uh, he, he, he stopped wearing clothes and he started living in the graveyards and started screaming at people. And uh, they, they came and tried to chain him up and couldn't do it. Uh, and the demons would break him free. And, you know, I mean, uh, that sounds like a pretty rough run. Amen. Uh, there's the other stories where they brought Jesus uh, individuals, you know, to heal. And one of them, they said, you know, uh, this is my son. He is sorely afflicted. Uh, the, the demon catches him and throws him in the fire and tries to drown him in the water. Can you do anything? I got news for you. You got a demon, you got a problem. 
Amen? You got a problem. And, and, and they, they, I love the stories because they bring him to the only place there's a solution, right? I mean, that's the case. And, and apparently, somewhere along the line, uh, this is what happened to her. But I, can't, I just can't picture what that would be like. I can't imagine what, what, what it would be like to be you know, possessed. I mean, have, 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 do things that you wouldn't want to do. Say things you wouldn't want to say. Have things happen to you that you don't want at all because you're possessed by a demon. What would that, what would be like, that be like? And I think about that, and then I think about this. What if I had seven of them? Take that, take that, that, take that nightmare that you're thinking of and multiply that by seven. I mean, I can't even picture what that would be. I mean, I just can't imagine. I mean, your, your, your whole life would have been given over to it. Your whole, uh, your whole existence given over to that. And, and you, have this, you, have this, you have this horrible, horrible thing going on in your life. But there's some good news here. What if those demons got cast out? Amen? That would be something, right? Now, we don't have the story of how it happened, just that it happened. Mark includes that as well, that, uh, that, that, that they get cast out. And, and we know that Jesus was the one who did it. He cast them out. He, you know, may I say this to you? Jesus had authority over them. Can I say this to you as clearly as I know how to put it? He still has authority over them. And someday, someday he's going to exercise his full authority and put them right where they belong. And I say this to you, he's also going to use his full authority to put me and you where we belong. Amen. I can't picture what that would be like. To live, a, to live that existence, you know, where this, this thing, or multiple things in this case were, I mean, who knows what she went through. Who knows the sort of things that she suffered? Who, knew, who knows, you know, how, I, I mean, how many times that she was just, you know, that, 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 that demon just got near to destroying her, brutalized her, abused her. I mean, I mean the, the, I, you know, I, I, it scares me to think about that this could happen to a human being. And yet it happens to her. And all of a sudden, Jesus, you know, shows up on the scene. And he commands them, I, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, go out, I, I'll go past where scripture says, but I'll just kind of guess that Jesus commands them to come out. And you know what? They come out. Because that's how it works with Jesus. Jesus has full authority. In fact, uh, that you, you remember when, they, when he did that deal with the pigs? You remember that story? And they, the, 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 all the demons said, you know, uh, don't, uh, where, where are we going to go? Well, you know, don't, don't, have you come to destroy us? You know, and he let, they, Jesus lets them go into the pigs. And then the pigs uh, get smart and go and drown themselves. Which is probably the best thing that can happen to you if you're a, if you're a pig and you're possessed by a demon. The best place to go is off the cliff. Now, Jesus casts these out of this woman, and she follows him around. You know, got the picture? She always follows him around. In fact, she follows him. Uh, we, we have multiple places in the scripture where it talks about, you know, she's following around with, what, what, in his ministry. Uh, I, I wondered how much of Jesus' ministry she got to see. I just really wonder about that. Uh, I mean, she's, uh, if, she's a, if she's a person of uh, means, she's able to travel, you know, with, 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 with the disciples and all the crowds and that kind of thing. I mean, did she, did she see Jesus um, feed the multitudes, for instance? Did she see him heal blind people and deaf people? And lame people, people who couldn't talk. Did she watch him cast demons out of other people? Was she around, you know, when, when all that was going on? Well, you, you, you suppose she was around to see Lazarus, the, you know, Lazarus, because there was a bunch of folks there to see that. What would that have been like? I wonder if you ever saw somebody else get, get a demon cast out of them and said, that's what happened to me. Now, what if the individual who cast the demons out of you ended up crucified? 
is the next time we find her in the scripture, she is at the cross. It's interesting. Um, all of Jesus' disciples, the apostles all made a run for it. With the exception of one, uh, you have his eyewitness account in here. And yet, there were at least four ladies that the scripture talks about who were at the cross when Jesus died. And one of them was Mary Magdalene. Now I want you to think about that. Think about what it would be like to have known Jesus as your healer, as your savior, as someone who cast the demons out of you. And then you had to watch him die. I mean, you talk about heartbreak, man. There it is, right? I mean, I mean that, that, must have, that must have crushed her. You know, I, I just can't imagine. You know, because I, I think all the, all, the, all the apostles thought the same thing. All the disciples thought the same thing. That there was no way that Jesus could possibly be killed. I mean, there was just no, it, it never even entered their mind. And even when Jesus talked about it, they couldn't buy into it. Peter took him aside one time when Jesus was talking about it. I said, uh, Lord, this is never going to happen to you. Just get it clear. This is never, no, I, I wouldn't let that happen to you. And yet it did. And so here you have this, you have this picture. And I, I think, man, what did, that, what did that mean to her? There at the foot of that cross, watching the person who saved her, the person who cast those demons out of her die. What in the world could that have been like? If Jesus' story stopped on Friday, well, me and you shouldn't be here this morning. Amen? No reason for us to be here if Jesus' story stopped then. But thank God, Sunday was coming. Right? I, I don't know what Saturday, I, I sort of think of uh, uh, Friday was the tragedy and Saturday, you know, was just misery. But Sunday, <laughs> Sunday was a brand new story. Can I say it to you? When Jesus rose, and, and, and what's interesting to me about that, it talks about the fact that she had gone to the, she, she'd gone to the tomb early, found the, found the stone was rolled away. By the way, uh, have y'all ever wondered why, they rolled the, why the stone got rolled away? Can I say something to you? And I, 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 think, I, I, think, I, can, I think I can back this up. The stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out of the tomb. Can I make this clear to you? That was not why they rolled the stone away at all. Uh, Jesus could have got out of the tomb without any help at all. I mean, he could have left the stone sitting there, just been sitting around outside. But, but that, that wasn't why. They, you say, how do you know that? Well, because later on, Jesus is going to appear to his disciples in a locked room with all the doors shut, with all the windows shut. And they're sitting around eating. And all of a sudden, Jesus is right there. Didn't come through a window, didn't come through a door. Jesus is right there. And he could have done that here, but he did not. In fact, what happened was, in fact, the angels got into the process. You remember the story. Uh, came, rolled that stone away, which would have taken several men to do. And this one angel rolls it up. And, and not only does he roll it out of the way, he goes and sits on it. Why would they roll the stone away then if Jesus didn't need it to get out? So people could get in, right? So, so uh, John and Peter and those guys could come and look. and Mary Magdalene could peek in and see the biggest attraction about that tomb is there was nobody in that tomb. I am wondering at what point Mary figured it out. She hadn't figured it out just by looking at the tomb, the fact that the tomb was empty. She hadn't figured it out then. Uh, she went out, you remember the story, and, uh, and she was there, and she turns around, and there's a guy standing there, and she thinks he's the gardener, and she, they have this conversation. 
If you ask Mary Magdalene, she would tell you. And her testimony lives on in these pages that you and I have read. She could assure you that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. That his power extended not... It, it, it wasn't just the power that he had here on earth. It wasn't just that. It wasn't just his ability to heal blind people and make them see again. It wasn't just his ability to, to pick up folks who were, who, who were unable to walk and all of a sudden give them their legs back. It, it, it was more than that. It was, it was more than just being able to cast demons out of people. It was more than being able to raise people from the dead. What happened with Jesus was it showed absolutely categorically that he had power over everything. And hear me say it, he still does. Now, I don't know what you've got going on in your life. Some folks may have wandered in here today and you, you know, you say, man, I'm having a rough time. Can I say this to you? You ain't having near as rough a time as uh, Mary Magdalene was having before she met Jesus. But I like the, G the idea that Jesus has no limitations whatsoever. Can I say it to you? It's still that way. There are still no limitations on what he's able to do. And he can, he, can, he can change your life for the better. In fact, he can do so today. In fact, to be truthful, I can't imagine a better time for him to do that in your life. If you've got problems, man, Jesus has got answers. If you've got difficulties and troubles and woes and problems and frustrations and aggravations and all those other things. You know what the scripture tells you to do? You should cast all your care upon Jesus. Why? Because he cares for you. Your brother Steve, he doesn't even know my name. Oh, he knows more than your name, buddy. He knows more than your name. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows you down to the last little hair on your head. He can tell you how many you got, or if you got. He knows what you had for breakfast this morning, if you had breakfast this morning. He knows, he knows you down to everything, everything. He knows every single thing about you. Brother Steve, he's, he's busy and he's up there, you know, uh, you know uh, on high running everything. I mean, he, he don't have time to mess with me. You're wrong. He knows you intimately. And what he really desires is for you to know him intimately as well. I love Mary Magdalene. I really do. I just think, man, Wow. Talk about, talk, about, talk, talk about a world changer right here it was, right? I mean, I mean, changed everything in this woman's life, everything about it. Can I say it to you? He can change your life as well. If you'll just give him the chance, would you bow your heads with us while we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being in your house today, and thank you for your goodness and grace and love and mercy. Thank you for... Thank you for being willing to come. We who were hopeless, we who were helpless, we who had no means of saving ourselves, and you looked down upon us, even the folks in this room here, and you saw that there was no chance for any of us outside of what you did for us. What an amazing thing to think that you loved us. Loved us so much that you were willing to die on Calvary. Not just die on Calvary, but rise again on the third and appointed day to show us that everything that you ever said was true. Lord, I don't know what the needs are in this place. I don't know what people are going through. I don't know what their circumstance or situation is. But I know that you already know everything about it. And I also know that if they're going to have some help, it's going to have to come from you. So Lord, as we give this invitation today, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts. 
I pray that you will just reveal to us what it is you'd have for us to do. Maybe there's some folks here who need to confess some things. Maybe there's some folks here who need to uh, surrender some things. Maybe there's some folks here who need to uh, obey what it is you've given them to do. Maybe there's somebody here who's never come to that place in their life where they've surrendered all to Jesus and known what it's like to have their sins completely forgiven. Maybe if they're here today, Lord, would you speak to them and help them to know that getting to know you is the most important thing that they'll ever do. And maybe there are Christians here, Lord, who maybe aren't quite where they ought to be. And maybe today is the day that you brought them to this place, that they might rededicate their hearts and lives to you. Have you forgiven them, Lord, but just as you forgave them at the start? Maybe there are folks here who just need to follow you in some specific way. Maybe there's somebody here who just needs to come and pray for somebody else. I don't know what the needs are, but I know you do. So let your Holy Spirit do his work. and Give us the grace and courage to respond. For we ask these things in the precious, perfect, powerful name of Jesus. It's in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.